Well, a couple of months ago, my wife, Lorreen, and I were home on just an ordinary weekday evening, and our son, Jesse, was home with us, and so Jess and I were sitting on the couch in our family room, sort of halfway watching a ball game or something on TV, and I had my laptop open, sort of halfway working on something, a sermon or something I don't remember. Um, and it's important for you to understand that scenario because I was already kind of paying attention to two things, the TV and the ball game and my laptop, because at some point my wife entered the room from this side and she said something. <laughs> and out of the periphery of my consciousness, I could hear her voice saying something to me. And what I heard her say was, this is our first week missing Canaan. And that made sense to me because our youngest son, Canaan, had just gone back to college. And so without taking my eyes off the screen, the TV, I said back to her, yeah, I miss him too. And then I was aware of an awkward sort of pause and aware that something maybe had gone wrong. Uh, she said then to me, what did you think I just said? And I turned away from the TV and looked at her and said, you said this is our first week missing Canaan. And she immediately burst into laughter. My son just shook his head sadly. And she said, what I said was, this is our first week missing our cleaning ladies. <laughs> now, I tell that story because it illustrates a couple of important truths. And no, it's not that I don't listen to my wife. That's not the issue. The issue is my focus is so intense, I can only aim it at one thing at a time. No. Actually, the truth is this. The point is, there's a big difference between hearing something and listening to someone. We're in a summer long series called The Disciplines of Grace and week by week we've been talking uh, to each other about building spiritual habits into our lives. <clears throat> Things like gratitude, generosity, serving, confession. And week by week building these, these positive uh, uh, spiritual habits into our daily lives. And today we're going to talk about the discipline of listening. And we're going to look at something Jesus talked about uh, with his disciples about moving from just hearing to listening. And it comes to us in John's Gospel, chapter 10. I'm going to read the ten, first 10 verses here, and then we'll take it apart and look at what he's teaching us today. John chapter 10, these are the words of Jesus. He says, very truly I tell you Pharisees. Now remember the Pharisees were the most religious of their day, uh, but they did not believe Jesus was the Messiah of God. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Now notice, Jesus is using a, a picture that people in that culture in that time would have totally understood. They all knew what sheep were. They all knew what shepherds did. They all knew what a sheep pen was. If Jesus were talking to us today, he might talk about, you know, our pet labrador retrievers or something we could relate to. Verse 2, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now, the first thing to see here is that when Jesus uses the image of sheep, to teach us about our relationship with him, it's not a particularly flattering analogy. Anyone here grow up on a farm and have any familiarity with sheep? Okay. Well, then you might be able to tell me whether I, I get this or not. But sheep are, are cute and cuddly from a distance, but up close, you know, not so much. Um, sheep are actually when you get up close to them, rather filthy animals. Their wool includes a substance called lanolin, and it makes things stick to it, like dirt and mud and, and uh, sticks and so forth. Even their own waste sticks to the wool. And sheep don't really have the ability to clean themselves, and so they have to wait for the shepherd eventually to clean them up a bit. 
Sheep are also fairly helpless creatures. They are timid and easily frightened. Uh, unlike goats, uh, goats can sort of forage for themselves and make their own way. Sheep uh, need a shepherd to care for them, to lead them. And Jesus says there are two kinds of shepherds. First, he says there is a false shepherd, or what I'm calling this morning the false shepherd. Uh, when I was just out of college back years ago, I lived with my parents for the summer, and uh, one night I stayed out uh, very late, past midnight, sort of an old college habit that I hadn't died yet, and some of you who are college students might know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I stayed out very late, and when I got home in the wee hours of the morning, the house was locked. My dad, just by habit, had just locked the front door, and I didn't have a key. And I think it was probably intentional on his part, but never really talked about that. Uh, I didn't have a key, so I didn't want to ring the doorbell and wake everybody up inside because of the time it was, so I, oh, I'll, I'll get in by another way. So I walked around the side of the garage and looked at the garage side entrance, and it was locked. Went around to the back of the house where we had a screened-in porch. That screen and porch door was open, but the sliding glass door inside getting into our family room was locked as well. So what am I going to do? I tried one more window, the little window in the kitchen that was above the sink. That one slid open. So I took off my shoes, climbed headfirst into the kitchen window, uh, falling into the sink, tumbling into the kitchen, and managed not to wake anybody up. Now, while I was doing that, it occurred to me that that probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, to break into the house like that, because who breaks into a house like that? Okay, only, a, only a, an intruder. And if my mom had walked into the kitchen and had a frying pan handy, I might have I been in trouble there. But Jesus is saying that anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a robber. Now he uses two different words here, and he uses them intentionally. The first word is kleptes in Greek. It's translated thief. We get our word kleptomania from it. It means one who steals by stealth. You know, one who sneaks in and takes something before you know he's stolen something. But the other word, translated robber, means one who plunders with violence. So a thief might break in and steal my TV. I might not even know it till the morning. But a robber breaks in, assaults me and my family, then takes my TV. And Jesus uses both words. He says, that's what the false shepherd does. In fact, in verse 10, he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The question is, who or what is Jesus talking about? Who are the false shepherds? He's actually talking about the Pharisees here. That's kind of his point. Those who taught a kind of legalistic righteousness, those who took great pride in their strict adherence to religious law, but whose hearts were actually far from God. Those who were teaching religion without relationship. Jesus says they are like false shepherds. So we might ask today, who or what are the false shepherds today? Who or what are those that steal, kill, and destroy today? Now, we might think of things that destroy life, like disease, things like depression, maybe destructive things like addiction or alcoholism. But the Bible teaches that behind all those things, all those destructive things, is our ultimate enemy, the one the Bible calls Satan, the deceiver, the liar, the one who destroys. If we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, the first couple of chapters of your Bible, you see the serpent in the garden. And the serpent is the one who questions the goodness of God. Satan is the one who lies. He's the one who tempts. He's the one who makes bad things look good. He's the one who promises that we can be like God, that we don't need the limits of God around our lives. He's the one that promises to make us happy, but he destroys. It's why Peter, later in, the, in, in his letter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Jeff mentioned uh, that I have just returned from a 17-day trip to Turkey and Africa to visit a number of our Serve the World partners all over the world, including stops in Tanzania, Rwanda, and Uganda, um, and in these parts of the world, uh, the, the, the enemy attacks in very obvious ways, at least to my view, uh, through devastating poverty, needs so great you can't even fathom, through the oppressive power of Islam, for example, and in many places by superstitions rooted in centuries-old practices of witch doctors and curses, things that lead people into fear and bondage. You can see it, it's obvious. But here in America, in our culture, 
I think our enemy is much more subtle than all of that. His lies are the same lies as he gave in the book of Genesis in the garden, but much harder for us to recognize. For example, the promise that, that more wealth will make us happy. That's everywhere in our culture. It's not true. The promise that education or science or politics will someday solve all human problems. It's not true. And more than any of those, there's what I call the cultural gospel. Do you know what our cultural gospel is today? Our cultural gospel today is you are your own truth. Not that God is the source of all truth, but that you are the source of all truth. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. How often do we see it out in social media? Speak your truth. And everybody claps. Jesus says these are lies. These are lies of the enemy who has not come to give life. He's come to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says, do not listen to his voice. But the only way we can discern the voice of the false shepherd from the voice of the true shepherd is to know the true shepherd, he says. And that leads me to the second point, and that is the true shepherd. Uh, when I was growing up as a young boy, uh, same age as many of you here, six or eight, ten years old, one of the constants in my life uh, was my father's ability to whistle. Uh, he, somewhere in his life, he learned this unique technique that I could never imitate. I tried and tried and tried. I couldn't do it. Uh, he could just, he didn't use his fingers. He just pursed his lips, and he could issue a shrill, loud, unique whistle with a unique sort of warble to it uh, that my brother and I learned to recognize. Uh, we'd be out playing in the neighborhood somewhere, blocks away, you know, quarter mile, half mile away. And when dinner time came around, uh, my dad would just step out on the front or back porch and whistle. And we would stop whatever we're doing. It'd be my brother, my younger brother Joe, or myself. We'd go, oh, wait, 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 stop, stop. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? We'd listen. And sure enough, we could hear that whistle coming through the, the neighborhood. And we would stop whatever we're doing, touch football, stand like baseball, and we would run home. Because that whistle meant it was supper time. Now, why do we do that? We did it because we knew the whistle belonged to our father. We learned to listen to it. And we knew our father loved us and our mother as well. And we knew that we had a home to go to where there was food on the table. There was love. It was a place where we belonged. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Verse 2, he says, The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus says the true shepherd enters by the gate. Later in verse 7, he says that he is the gate for the sheep. Now here he's using an analogy that the people of the ancient world would recognize because in that part of the world at that time, and even today in some places of the world, when the shepherds are out on the field with the sheep, they will build a sort of an impromptu pen for the sheep using brush or stones or sticks, and it'll be sort of a, a circle or a square-like structure, but it'll leave an opening for the sheep to get in and out. And across that opening at night, the shepherd will lay down his own body so that if a predator is going to get in, a predator has to go over the very body of the shepherd, and the shepherd can protect the sheep. Or if a sheep is going to leave, the shepherd's body protects and so in that way, the shepherd be becomes the protection for the sheep. And Jesus is the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And then he says, the sheep listen to the true shepherd because the shepherd knows them by name. Now, something interesting about sheep, uh, and I, I've never been a shepherd, but I, I've talked to a few guys who've done that. And we now know that sheep, even though they're not the brightest of creatures, they can recognize human faces. And they can recognize voices. And each shepherd would develop a unique call, like my dad's whistle, that we recognized. And sheep can recognize and follow that voice. So here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that he knows you. He's saying that he knows your name. Now, I, I want to let that sink in just for a bit. Do you know that? Do you know that your shepherd knows you by name? The Bible says he knew you before you were born, as hard as that is to fathom. And then every day of your life, from the first day until this day today, he's known you. 
No matter how far from him you've been, no matter how fast you've run the other way, your joys, your sorrows, your shames, he's known you. And he loves you. And he calls to you to follow him and to trust him. Jesus says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. The shepherd leads the sheep out because he's leading them somewhere good. He's leading them to pasture, to water, to feed. He's leading them toward life. And that leads to the third point today, and that is the promise of true life. The promise of true life. One of the great blessings of having the, the privilege of, of visiting parts of the world, uh, as I did just the last couple of weeks, is meeting some amazing people. People like Pastor Fred Wangwa. Uh, I spent two days with Pastor Fred in Uganda. Um, and one day as we were driving somewhere, I just asked him, hey, Fred, just give me your story. Tell me your story. He spoke a number of languages, but English being one of them. And in a nutshell, this was his story. Fred grew up in a family of 12 children born to a mother and an alcoholic father in the slums of Mbale, Uganda, a village, a, a big a town up to the northeast of uh, Kampala um, at the foothills of the mountains. His early life was so impoverished that he would often go days without food. In fact, one of his younger brothers died of starvation right in front of his eyes. He was unable to go to school because his father wouldn't take him to school. So he, had, he was working in local fields by the age of six just to uh, be able to, to scratch out enough food to live on. And at age seven, he decided that he, he needed to find a different life for himself. Imagine, age seven. So he found his way to a tiny village church near where he lived, and he heard the gospel of Jesus for the first time. And he learned about a shepherd who loved him and knew him. And he put his faith in Christ. And he said he went to that church every day after that. Every day, month after month, year after year, just to be around these people who loved him and cared for him. And so he could learn. And eventually, he had the chance to take classes at a Bible college. Now, he never went to school. But he had got chances as a late teenager to go to a Bible college locally. And he was so gifted academically, they scholarshiped him all the way through. To fast forward, make a long story short, at age 23, he was asked to become pastor of that same church. And in the 11 years since, he has led the construction of a new church building, which I visited and was able to preach at last Sunday. Uh, he then found a way to plant 10 new churches in the foothills of the mountains that are nearby and trained personally 10 pastors to lead those 10 churches. And on top of that, he serves as the spiritual director of the Cure Hospital of Uganda, one of the leading neurological surgery centers in all of East Africa. And he invited me to preach at his church. And then he invited me to baptize with him 12 people that afternoon, finishing with this young man. Now, Pastor Fred is not famous. I had never heard of him before. You never did either. He's not wealthy. In fact, by our standards, he's exceedingly poor. He doesn't have a website. He doesn't have a blog. But as I understand Jesus, if I understand Jesus at all, Pastor Fred at age 34 has already lived a life of true greatness. He's, living, he's a living example of the fullness of life Jesus is talking about. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now, something interesting here, the word life is not the word for biological life. That was the Greek word bios, from which we get biological. He uses a different word for life here, zoe. It means full life. It means real life. It means spiritual life. It means eternal life. So what kind of life, Zoe, does the good shepherd promise? What's Jesus saying? What is a life that is full? I think Jesus promises new life in at least four ways, and you've heard me talk about this before. He promises us a new heart. When I got back from my trip on Thursday night, I had this heavy suit, uh, piece of luggage, and every piece of clothing I had was dirty, every single piece. And so opening that 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 uh, piece of luggage after uh, 20 some hours of travel was kind of a traumatic experience opening that up. Um, clothes have been stained by sweat and dirt and, and mud. They needed to be washed. And the same is true of our hearts. We're all stained by the world. We've been dragged through this world. Our hearts are stained by sin. Now our culture doesn't word, use that word anymore. We don't use the word sin anymore in public discourse. But we all know what it is. We all know what it is. Guilt, regret, 
pain. Every person you've ever known in the course of your life, from your family to your neighbors to your boss, every single human being is trying to deal with that heart issue in some way, shape, or form. We need, we long for new hearts. The Bible says that our hearts are washed clean, made new by one thing, by the blood of Christ, because he took on himself our filthiness so that we might be made clean in him. We're no longer slaves to sin. We've been set free. We have new hearts. Secondly, we have new identity. We hear a lot about identity these days in our culture. But what is identity? It's just how we come to think of ourselves. (coughs) Excuse me, what we think of ourselves. What did Jesus say? He said, you must be born again. The Apostle Paul said, the old is gone, the new has come. In Romans, Paul teaches us that through Christ we are adopted as sons and daughters of God himself. This means as followers of Jesus, we are no longer identified primarily by our physical appearance, by our culture, by our language, by our education, by our successes, by our talents. We are identified by the transforming love of Christ for us. It's Jesus who tells us who we are because he is our shepherd and we belong to him. New identity. Thirdly, the gospel gives us new purpose. And what is our new purpose? To make as much money as we can? To live as comfortable a life as we can? No. Our purpose is to live and serve in the eternal kingdom of God. Why do we set aside a day, August 24th, to be a great day of serving? when we hope a thousand of us serve together in one day just to make an impact in our community. Why do we do that? Because that's what followers of Jesus were recreated to do. We live and serve in the community called the church for that purpose. I visited probably 10 or 12 churches in Africa, just so different from each other. Languages and cultures and dress and worship, and some of them dance and some of them don't. Some of them don't even have buildings. They meet under trees. But all of them the same. Because we all exist in this community that by its very presence announces to the world that a new kingdom is here. A greater kingdom is here. It's our purpose. And finally, fourthly, the gospel gives us new destiny. A new destiny. One of my stops in Africa was the CURE, C-U-R-E hospital in Uganda. Jeff visited a CURE hospital a couple years ago in in, uh, Zambia. This hospital focuses on neurological issues, particularly Uh, a a thing called hydrocephalus and spina bifida. They're connected. And so Pastor Fred took me through this hospital. And I I, I took pictures, but I decided not to put any on the screens because they're too hard to look at. I didn't want to create trauma. These are little children under two years old whose heads have swollen to two and three times normal size. And they have procedures there to save these children's lives and to give them some sort of hope for the future. And Pastor Fred and I, he just led me through, and I felt so helpless. But we just prayed for these mothers and these children. And as I think of the 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 issues Jeff mentioned today, the the horror of El Paso and, and even Dayton, the Bible tells us that this life, this earthly life with all its pains and struggles, and illness and disease and death. This life is not all there is. Our eternal destiny is to live and reign with Jesus in the new heaven and new earth forever where there is no more sin, no more death, no more disease, no more sadness. This is the new life. This is the fullness of life the shepherd is promising to us. So how do we listen to the shepherd? How do we learn to discern his voice? Does Jesus still speak today? He does. I want to mention just two ways. I could mention several others, but two for this morning. First, we learn to listen to his voice through his word. Through his word. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to teach and guide. And the Spirit does that primarily through God's word. We learn to hear the shepherd's voice through his word. Just as my brother and I learned to hear and discern our father's whistle because we heard it day after day after day. And we knew that sound. So also there is absolutely no substitute for time spent in God's word. Read, dwell, pour over it. Stay with a single verse over and over again until he speaks to you because he will. It's his promise. Secondly, through prayer. 
through prayer. When I think about prayer, I always remember a story. Um, I, when I was a young boy, 10, 12 years old, I uh, accidentally walked into my dad's office. He was a pastor, and he was on the phone with someone. And I realized as I walked in, he was on the phone. So I immediately started to back out, but my dad went, like, come on in, it's okay. So I went in and sat down by his desk, and I could hear through the, rec- through the phone, the old-fashioned phone with two parts to it, you know, that kind of used to hold up like this. And I could hear a voice just chattering away on the other end. My dad was just going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This voice was chattering. <laughs> and then my dad put his hand over the part of the phone and he went, watch this. And he pulled out a drawer and he put the phone in the drawer <laughs> and shut it. And he only left it there for maybe 30 seconds or a minute. We chatted a little bit. And he took it out again. I could hear the voice still going. <laughs> now, it wasn't the most pastoral thing to do, but he did that. <laughs> Because he knew this other person. He knew that this other person was never going to take a breath to listen to anything. And I think sometimes we pray a little bit like that. Now, God doesn't put us in a drawer. But I think sometimes we just chatter. We, actually, we talk. We just talk, 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 talk. Give me, give me, give me. Help me, help me, help me. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. And we never take time to listen. What kind of relationship is only one directional? What kind of relationship is there if we never listen? Prayer is about more than asking God for things. It's good to ask him for things, but prayer is also about gratitude. It's worship and it's listening. It's listening for the voice of Jesus quietly speaking to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you know? Well, compare what you think he's saying to you with what he's already told us in his word. He won't contradict himself. Or check with a trusted friend, a pastor, someone who can help you discern. One of the most exciting things in all of spiritual life is sensing the shepherd speak to you personally. I want to finish with a story that I've told before, uh, and I'll tell it till the day I die because it was formative in my own journey. I was 25 years old, not yet married, believed I had a call to ministry, but I was stuck. I was frustrated. I didn't know how to, where to go. And so I decided, I was, I was, um, decided one night to pray until I had an answer. I, I needed to, do I go to a seminary? Do I go find a job? What do I, I don't know what to do. And so I just prayed. I, and I prayed this one night, and I was praying everything I knew how to pray. Pr- just pray, and I just ran out of words. I did nothing, just ran out of words. And after I ran out of words, the strangest thing happened. I, I heard a voice, not, out, not weirdly, outwardly, not anything like that, but just in, internally, in, in my spirit. And the voice said quietly, started with my name, Brian, I love you. And my first reaction was, I know that, but I need to know what you want me to do. You call me, what do I do? Where do I go? And he said it again, Brian, I love you. I said, I know that. I've known that since I was five years old. I used to sing the songs. I know. I need to know what you want me to do. And he said it the third time, Brian, this time more insistent, I love you. And the most interesting thing happened. The third time, I began to weep, and I don't weep very easily. I began to just weep. And what I realized was that before I could do anything, before I could serve in any way, my shepherd wanted me to know two things. First, that he loved me. And second, he needed me to know what his voice sounded like. He needed me to learn to recognize his voice. We've been talking about a challenge every week every week, something to build into, to to explore in your spiritual life. And here's what I want you to think about this week. Whatever you do in in your daily habits spiritually, whether you take time in the morning, in the evening, on the way to work, whatever you do, add this little piece if you don't already. Just add a couple of minutes to listen where you stop talking, quiet your heart, ask him to speak, and then listen. Two minutes will feel like forever. Five minutes to feel like an eternity. Just listen. Do that each day this week, and when you get to the end of the week, Friday or Saturday, take an extended time. Take 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. Walk, sit, and just listen. Listen for the quiet voice of your shepherd who speaks your name. Listen to him encourage, convict, direct, and then talk to someone about it. Before we move to communion today, we're going to give you just a, just a moment as the music plays. Just, so just bow your heads. Take just a moment and reflect. Prepare yourself for communion. And listen for the voice 
of your good shepherd.